Well, we are now coming into day three, and uh, we're starting this morning where Alessandro again is going to take us into one of the areas of uh, social signal processing. This time it's going to be how we detect and analyze conflict, or at least how we have started to do that. Later on in the day, we'll come back to the two uh, modalities that we have already been talking about a little, that is both vision and sound, so it'll be more on face and more on, on how to analyze sound. And then there will be some workshops, and I have to look at my computer because we'll be moving the workshops around, so I'll tell you later what workshops you have to choose from today. Alessandro, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. So, after you more, I mean, after a very harmonic atmosphere we have here, I thought it was a good idea to talk a little bit about uh, conflict, which is in any case something that is important in our life. And once again, independently of uh, uh, say the specific topic, the specific results, I think it's going to be interesting if you're interested in understanding more or less how we work at least on the analysis side in social signal processing. So what type of first steps, what type of methodologies after all we, we adopt. And basically we will start by focusing, trying to understand what do we mean exactly when we talk about uh, conflict. Then we will show how we have collected the data in order to do our experiments. Because in social signal processing data collection is an integral part of the experiment. Data is not just something you get, it's something you have to actively prepare in order to obtain good uh, scientific results, then the experiments and at the end some little work of uh, conclusion. So first of all, what do we mean exactly when we talk about conflict? Because in general, whenever I present this word, people think conflict is when people fight or people shout or decide with people, but it's not necessarily true. Conflict can be very cold. Because, you know, what conflict is, here is a definition which, you know, you can find many different uh, uh, similar. First of all, this says that it is a very important uh, phenomenon because it can substantially affect the welfare of both individual members and the group as a whole. So this gives a motivation of why it is important to study because it is really something that can change the life of people that are involved in conflict and can have, in some cases, even very long-term effect. But what we mean by conflict is a mode of interaction where the attainment of the goal by one party precludes its attainment by the others. And I think this is very much important, again, in the spirit of what I said in the other presentation. We always work a lot in bridging the gap between something we can observe, and this is the most superficial part, which is the mode of interaction, a certain way of behaving, <coughs> of participating in conversation, of acting, of whatever it is, but what is really important is what we cannot observe. And in this case, what we cannot observe is that the attainment of the goal by one party precludes its attainment by the others. So conflict is actually, the real thing is the incompatibility of the goals between the different participants. I see the questions here, yes. Yeah, um, you presumably though want to also include situations where it's not uh, the attainment of the goal that's in dispute, but uh, perspectives that are in dispute. So if you have two irreconcilable perspectives, uh, I think you would still say there is a conflict, right? Yes, in general, when you talk about conflict here, when you talk incompatibility about goals, then you know it can be uh, goal in a very general sense. For example, imposing this perspective, making this perspective accepted, so the incompatibility is one and incompatibility between goals. You can look at that in this sense. But maybe the important point is incompatibility mm -hmm. between yeah. uh, something, whether it is access to resources, but a situation where if one perspective is accepted, the other is not. So in that sense they are incompatible because... I, I bring that up just because yeah, I have yeah. such sure, 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 interest yeah. in perspectives. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, that you, can, you can look at that too. Other question? It's a little bit related to that, but uh, just uh, uh, mentioned that uh, <coughs> the goal could be should be explicit in the conversation itself because it can of goals. Sure. They apply. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, independent of the findings, we are going to see in particular in the specific example here. My focus is really to go a little bit beyond the very basic or uh, lay definition of conflict of a fight between people. 
it is not really about that. That could be a manifestation of conflict, but conflict is mainly about an incompatibility between perspective, access to resources, goals, different goals. At a certain point, people are involved in such a situation where if one manages to get what he or she wants, the other does not. This is a bit uh, the situation. And some of this is something we cannot really observe. It's something we can infer. There's, there can even be a lack of clarity about goals. And, but the important thing is, again, from a computing point of view, because remember, I'm a computing guy, that we have something we can observe, we can detect with our machines, we can analyze, and something we cannot observe, which is this incompatibility. So somewhat the important thing for us is to bridge the gap between these two different uh, aspects of uh, what is called conflict. Yeah, but uh, the second yeah. one could never interfere with the first one, then it won't have conflict. It is clear that if there are no physical traces of this, yeah. so if this incompatibility doesn't leave physical traces, so the two people, for example, do not even manage to get into interaction, we will not observe conflict. So from a machine point of view, the conflict exists uh, because incompatibility is there. But um, as a machine, I mean, we cannot do anything because we cannot deal with machines with things that can be observed and detected. Huh? So that's, that's a good point. So at this point, you know, once you accept the definition of conflict, I mean, I see in this much more cognitive-oriented uh, environment of course that are much later, but the point is that once you accept one definition of concept, that our concept, and that's the one we have decided to adopt for our work, at a point some of data collection must reflect that. It doesn't mean you have to pick examples where does, does that in particular applies, but somehow you have to be aware in the collection of your data that what you really want to figure out is how this incompatibility at the cognitive level, at the level you cannot really observe, can be reflected actually from a point of view of behavior of social signals in our case. So here is a very general description I found on how to organize uh, experiments. You see four different types of experiments when it comes to the observation of uh, behavior. And you see that they are organized along two axes. And one is the manipulation of the scenario. What does it mean? You can tell people what you want them to do. For example, I've made experiments where I ask people whether well, it's the winter survival task. You have to discuss about uh, what are the items that can increase the chances of survival if you crash with a plane uh, in a polar area. Huh? That's a manipulation of the scenario in the sense that you ask people to discuss about something specific. You give them a kind of uh, task. But you can also avoid uh, doing that and leave the scenario open. Just leave people to interact as they want. And the other is the control of the setting. So control of the setting, it means you can tightly control the conditions around the interaction, or you can leave this totally uh, uncontrolled. And you see that somewhat, uh, according to how uh, your experiment uh, is located in these two, along these two axes, gives you different types of uh, uh, experiment. So we have naturalistic observation, which is where you don't control the setting, so you go to see things where they actually happen, and you do not control the scenario, you don't do the scenario. There are field experiments where you still don't control the setting, but for example, you can modify the conditions uh, so to see what change. So for example, here we can decide, well, next lecture will be in the Chinese pavilion, let's see what happens. In this case, I mean, still the scenario will not be manipulated, but the setting, yes. Then you can control uh, the setting while leaving the scenario uh, open, and in this case, you have a controlled observation in the sense that you do not intervene in what people do, but you still somewhat uh, control the condition. And then you have laboratory experiments where you basically intervene and control everything. Now, just to make it clear, I've presented several other times, and people start to say, well, but it should be better this or that. It's not that one is better than the other. This is just to introduce a taxonomy and understand a bit better how we are going to do the experiments in our case. I mean, depending on what you want to do, one particular way of uh, collecting data can be better than the others. Now, in our case, the data are political debates, so something that happens uh, in television. It didn't happen for our experiment. It's something that happened way before uh, our experiments. There is no real control of the setting or the scenario in the sense that it is true that it is a TV show, etc., but it's a piece of reality. 
And many people tell me, well, they are in television. Yeah, but these are real people, are real television, they go there with real motivation, these guys go there to get elected or to acquire consensus for their uh, ideas and causes. So from this point of view, I think that if I have to locate this, is a kind of uh, naturalistic observation huh? in a particular environment, but it's a naturalistic observation. Just to give an idea of the type of data we have, here is a little excerpt. There should be audio. And it's open. Is it contracting or something? Yeah. Well, I don't know. So, uh, so, we call this naturalistic observation? Well, I don't know. I mean, if I have to locate there in the sense that in any case uh, we do not control the scenario and we do not control the setting, maybe it is a controlled observation. I don't know. It can be interesting too. So let me just play it again just to get an idea. Sans Yes. This gives an idea of the data. We will see more samples uh, after. Well, this can be, I mean, I tend to think it can be considered a kind of naturalistic observation because in any case, uh, it is a real, it's a, it is a piece of reality, somewhat. There is no intervention on the scenario, or not really, there is certainly no control on the setting. I mean, it is something that has been created by people in a kind of normal condition. The problem is that the people who are being captured here are aware of being sure. captured by cameras sure. and so on. And that's the kind of capturing that people worry about in other cases when we're just doing scientific experiments. It's exactly the same kind of control. Well, I, I, being, being aware that you are being put yeah. on a tape or on a, you know, you're being recorded. So, but, uh, for example, me too, now I'm aware that I am uh, in exactly. front of a camera, in front of yeah. an audience. Does this really make this unrealistic or controlled or... To me, this is a piece of reality. It's part of my life. I'm genuinely motivated to give a good presentation because this is part of my job, this is part of my... So in, in this respect, I think that it's not that much the presence of a uh, capturing thing, but how artificial or non-artificial is the reason to be, to be there. Well, we, we have I don't know, several hundred recordings of people in different social situations, and I don't think we have more than one instance of a real quarrel. And, and that's even that's doubtful. I think people inhibit the more extreme variants of their behavior because they, I mean, this, the, the stuff which isn't so extreme sure. I think is completely natural and as usual. But, you know, swearing very uh, forcefully, screaming, etc. I think those things tend to get filtered out. Sure, <laughs> but as I mentioned before, I'm not interested in getting just people shouting or things like this. Right. I'm interested to see how people behave in a normal condition in a real condition, and there is an incompatibility between goals. And when you think about this, is exactly this situation, because you have seen even the disposition of the people, two and two. These conflicts are built around a question. One part is for yes, one part is for no. And these people know if one acquires consensus, the other loses consensus. If one of those guys gets elected, the other does not. So there is a direct incompatibility between goals. And you know, I. But for me, I have no real reason to consider this one or the other. It doesn't change the results or so. But I think that this is a piece of their life, a real piece of their life, where they respect some norms. Of course, they will not swear, they will not uh, insult heavily other people because you know they know this will be incompatible with their own goals. I mean, this, this, this will go against uh, their goals. But precisely in the activity of conflict, the yes. mode of interaction of conflict, this is a little disturbing because, you know, that's where we would expect some of the more extreme variants of behavior. And we are, we are only getting part of the spectrum of what people can do in conflict. Clearly. Yeah. I, clearly. I mean, it yeah. is a very precise, at the same time, you know, defining so precisely the context, to me, helps to understand the limitations as well of the experiment. At the same time, I can tell you that from a machine point of view, this is very interesting because, you know, getting people shouting is easy. Getting people 
not sharp in and having a more gradual and a more smooth definition of conflict is much more challenging. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the thing. It yeah. seems to me you have to talk about a continuum between naturalistic and controlled in sure, sure. situations like this, this, if not most, if not all situations. And, and there are various different factors along sure. which the situation is naturalistic or controlled. Now, politicians in these settings are very much like actors putting on a show. And if they are filtering out some conflict, then other forms of conflict are staged for the occasion because sure, 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 sure. it's yeah. an interesting point. It know, makes them look masculine yeah, yeah. or something. We have to see <laughs> that we will see that in any case that uh, one funny thing of this debate is a very small original television in Switzerland. So most of the people who are going to see examples are not professional politicians, high level people used to go on the stage. Sometimes they are people a bit more spontaneous that don't go that often. <laughs> Sorry, and that uh, some of you are, are a bit more spontaneous from this point of view. But it is true, sometimes it is something staged. And in any case, you know, even there is this very famous uh, case of Segovia Royale during uh, not the last election, but the uh, previous one, the last that was won by, by uh, Sarkozy, where Segovia Royale apparently lost sufficient <coughs> consensus to lose the election because she was saying, I'm indignated, I'm uh, furious about this, but all her communication was clearly saying something else, the, the normal language. So there was this kind of incoherence between, uh, she was staging her behavior badly, she was acting badly, and this somewhat has disturbed people. And that, that at least one of the explanations that was uh, given. But we will see that in this case, I mean, in most cases, these people are not smart or good or experienced enough to, to really add to, to that level. No? In any case, independently of where we want to put the experiments I'm going to present, I, mean, I think this is a nice way, keeping in mind that this is a continuous and not a classification, a continuous not a classification, I think it's a nice way to, to look in general at our experiments and to find limitations to find what they're actually worth about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what we did in the end, it was this in order to collect our data. So we selected basically political debates simply because of this incompatibility by construction in that particular scenario. These people go there because they have different opinions about something that they consider important. And of course, if one managed to impose her view, and the other one does not. Right? For a current consensus, the other loose consensus. If someone gets elected, the other does not, and so on. So from this point of view, overall, there is a certain incompatibility between costs, even though we will see that this is not always the case. So we took uh, a corpus of political debates, it's roughly 30 hours of material, 45 debates collected in Switzerland in 2005. And what we did is to cut them into pieces, 30 seconds long, and to keep only those pieces where you see at least two people. Otherwise, it is difficult to observe uh, conflict. So in total, you get uh, 1,430 clips, 30 seconds. None of them are eh? These are different pieces of uh, the recordings. So in total, it's something like 12 hours. 135 subjects, where five are moderators, so up here again and again. And what we did is we use a uh, mechanical tag. I don't know if you are familiar with this, it is a crowdsourcing system, which means we sent these clips to this system, they were diffused among thousands of potential annotators, and then annotators basically decide to do the job and they get a little money each time they annotate one of the clips. And by annotating I means to answer 15 questions that we are going to see in a moment about uh, the clip. And in total, this corresponds to more than 200,000 items, 200,000 questions that were answered. But at the end, we have 10 annotators per clip. Then, you know, we have much more actually, but part were discarded because we put the statistical uh, tricks in order to detect the people that answer uh, randomly. Eh? So from this point of view, we have more, but at least 10 per clip we have. Now, let's have a look at the questionnaire, because it is something that we devised together with the psychologist uh, at the University of Geneva. Now, if you look like this, the 15 questions look a bit, uh, you know, it's unclear what the structure uh, is. But you can see that there are two types of questions that correspond to the two layers I mentioned at the beginning. An observable layer, something I can touch, feel, sense, detect, etc. 
and an inferential layer, which is about the interpretation I did about the scene. Now, the question of the uh, observation layer, of the observable layer, the physical layer, how to call it, if you look at about the non-verbal cues that we can observe or not observe. So, for example, one or more people talk fast, one or more people fidget, one or more people shake their heads and nod, and so on. Now, the way we decided about these questions, it was simply to go through the literature that mentioned non-verbal correlates of conflict, and to pick the most frequent, the, the cues most frequently associated to conflict, and ask whether they were observed. And if you look at the inferential layer, you see there is things like atmosphere is relaxed, people argue, people show mutual respect, the ambience is tense, and so on. And you see this is not really something you, 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 you touch, you observe. This is just something that people interpret about the clip they observe. And what is nice in this uh, uh, way of organizing uh, uh, the questionnaire is that you have lighter scales associated to all of the items. And then what you can do is basically you, know, you map the, 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 the answers into number, and you can sum all of the answers that were given uh, to the inferential layer in an inferential score. You can do the same for the physical layer. And when we have 10 annotators per clip, uh, basically we average over the scores obtained by all the different annotators. And you expect, if you've done a good job, you expect that actually there is a certain correlation between the physical score and the inferential score. Because what we're really trying to do is to figure out whether those cues we ask here about actually account for the perception for the interpretation of, uh, of the clip in terms of tension, relaxation, etc., etc. And what we got is actually this one. So we get a very good correlation, is 0.95. So each point there is one of the clips. Uh, and uh, on the horizontal axis you have the physical score, and on the vertical axis you have the inferential score. So basically this tells us that these cues seem, according to the questionnaire at least, to account for the way people interpret the situation in terms of conflict. So now I'm going to show three examples of clips just to give you an idea of how, in particular, the inferential score actually follows a certain manifestation of uh, conflictuality uh, by showing one clip which is in the lower third of this range from here to here between the minimum and maximum inferential score we observe. One clip which is in the middle and one clip that is in the top. So this is low inferential score, hein? so it's for low conflict. 10 jours. Et donc un fumeur passif, je parle pas de, de fumeur actif. Donc c'est un vrai euh, problème de santé publique, hein? ça tue plus que les accidents de voiture. Monsieur Gessler, est-ce que ça vous parle, ces chiffres et puis cette euh, mise en garde alors, les chiffres me parlent tout à fait, je suis tout à fait conscient que le problème de fumée passive est, est un problème de, de dangerosité. Euh, où je ne suis pas d'accord, c'est avec l'interdiction, on est en train de déresponsabiliser à tous les niveaux. So, you see that basically here there seems to be no conflict, in the sense that fundamentally, you see the clips are in French, the annotators are in the US, so they do not understand French, and we ask them to state explicitly that they do not understand. Once again, in order to be sensitive only to nonverbal communication, people do not understand what they are saying. But for those to understand French, I mean, this is a kind of beginning of uh, the, the, the discussion. It is about smoking in public spaces. Both parties agree that smoking in public spaces is a problem. Huh? They, then, then in the rest of the debate, they will come out that uh, there are different solutions for the problem. But here, they both agree they have a problem. So from this point of view, it's not yet a point where there is real incompatibility. So you have this very quiet and smooth uh, uh, interaction. Then what happens in the case of medium? Eh? We are in the middle layer. Pour supporter la facture. Pour savoir comment on est actuellement dans la moyenne et que oui, on, on, a, on en a parlé. Oui, on est dans la moyenne, donc on va devoir rejoindre la moyenne supérieure et payer plus. Ok, d'accord, très bien. Monsieur Mezzo, pourquoi voter oui Il faut voter oui parce que le système actuel, il ne convient pas, il ne marche pas, que euh, les choses vont certainement s'aggraver, que la grande majorité des médecins euh, s'expriment clairement contre le système actuel et désirent un changement, et que ce sera certainement... 
So you see, the situation starts to change, and if you listen to the words, even at the verbal level, they start to say, I think <coughs> yes, I think no. They start really to explicitly mention a disagreement, a fundamental disagreement about the question at stake which was in particular a certain law about how to reinforce medical expenses or something like this. Okay, so they basically start explicitly having opposite positions about the same issues. And then, this is an example of the top third of conflict. Sans aller étranger, les, les requérants d'asile qui viennent, pardon, permettez-moi de finir, les requérants d'asile qui viennent par chez nous, ils viennent chez nous et puis on, pour, on leur payera, on payera le montant 200, 250 francs dans 37 pays. Ici, si les 37 pays, je peux vous les sortir ici, c'est vrai. Non, je ne pense pas, c'est tout à fait. Monsieur, écoutez, vous avez lu le libéralisme de femmes de patrons. Ça ne m'étonne pas ce que j'ai lu dans le... Ça aussi, not only it goes up, but even in terms of content, not only they clearly disagree, so they, they are talking about immigrants, and one says more immigrants, the other says less immigrants, but there is an explicit attack of one side to the other. So the man says to the lady, you lie, and you know that you are lying. So there is a very explicit uh, attack. <laughs> it's, not, it's no longer a kind of disagreement, different opinions, but even it becomes personal. Right? There is an attack against person. So you see how somewhat inferential there. These are not uh, selected, these are just randomly selected. And you see that some of the inferential layer seems to accompany, at least when it comes to the manifestation, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the physical evidence of conflict, the behavioral evidence of conflict to accompany the different uh, types of display. Out of curiosity, which of the two was opposing increase in immigration? <laughs> uh, it was the guy, uh, let me play it again. It's not immigration. Sans aller étranger. Oh. Les, les requérants d'asile qui viennent, pardon, permettez-moi de finir, les requérants d'asile qui viennent dans chez nous, mm -hmm. ils viennent on chez nous, on et puis on, pour, on leur paiera, on paiera le montant 200, 250 francs dans 37 pays ici, les 37 pays, je peux vous les sortir, c'est très bien. Non, je ne vois pas ce que c'est. Monsieur, écoutez, vous avez lu le libéralisme de femmes patrons. Ça ne m'étonne pas ce que j'ai lu dans le... C'est pas sur l'économie, c'est sur la valorisation de l'argent donné aux femmes et aux enfants. Et la femme est contre le fait que les femmes vont recevoir de l'argent, alors que le homme est en faveur du fait que les femmes qui vivent en Suisse vont recevoir de l'argent, n'importe quoi de l'argent. So yeah, so, so basically this is uh, the top. So, fundamentally you see that somewhat, you know, this inferential layer seems to smoothly accompany uh, the kind of behavioral evidence that we actually observe about conflict. Okay. So, this is just uh, for curiosity, this is the correlation of each individual non-verbal cue we have, uh, we have uh, collected via the questionnaire. You remember the different questions of the physical layer. So the individual correlation of those questions with uh, the inferential layer. Just to give an idea of what are the cues that seems to account most for the perception of people in terms of competence. You see, people wait before they wait for their time before they speak. One or more people speak fast, people fidget, people speak loud, people shake their heads and nod, uh, people interact, people gesture, uh, people compete to talk, and people frown. Can anybody tell me something bizarre that appears here? Maybe it can help if I put this slide. Bizarre, let's say, particular, let's say, but uh, bizarre is maybe it's a just, uh, But let's say a bit counterintuitive with respect to what we tend to think in general about... Is there weight in the loss? Sorry? Is there weight in the loss? No. It is that if you look uh, at what is above this line and below, below, so the lower correlations are for things we see with our eyes. People fidgeting, people nodding and shaking head, people gesturing. And 
people from. So the lowest correlations correspond to visual cues, or cues that we perceive via eyes, while everything we get through our ears, listening, are higher. Now, the interpretation we give about this, which is, you know, the particular with respect to the common uh, assumption that we are mainly visual uh, animals, is that in a case when you think about this type of edited data, so these are uh, what we see is what we see on TV, so it's not us deciding what we watch, it's the director of the debate that shows. So somewhat we cannot rely totally on what we see. In contrast, the microphones are always open. So we can hear what happens there, like if we were there. Well, we cannot watch what we want. So probably this is why, in this case, these cues that typically in the literature are supposed to be very strong cues, but, but uh, here we have a bit less. Now, just an interpretation, I don't know probably if you can give a better explanation, but it sounds some plausible consequence of the fact that we deal with, uh, with edited data. Hmm? Now, at this point, uh, so far, it might look like the work of some uh, person doing some ethnography or uh, uh, social psychology and so on at an amateurish uh, uh, level. But you know, at this point, we are people that do computing approaches. So our real goal is to have a machine that is capable of watching that scene or uh, somewhat processing that scene and predict automatically what can be the conflict level. So our goal is to predict automatically the inferential score associated to these things. And the problem we have is to measure something and to extract measurable cues and to convert all of these nonverbal cues into measures, numerical measures, that then we can use in order to make statistics and predict from those, from those physical measurements the inferential score. And in particular, we are going to focus on the speech channel for the very simple reason that apparently here uh, visual cues seem to wait uh, less. So, how can we basically transform all of these nonverbal behavioral cues, which are a bit an abstract concept? When we say people, let's say, interrupting, it's a very high level concept. Then, how can we measure this physically? Well, we started a number of physical measurements. First of all, we got statistics about uh, the uh, number and duration of times. So intervals during which clearly there is only one person that uh, speaks. And we do this automatically. So we throw the audio into a machine. The machine cuts into pieces uh, the different uh, audio recordings, so the 30 seconds of audio of each clip, and tells you here is a turn, here is another turn, and so on. And of course, does this with a certain amount of noise or mistakes. And this corresponds in particular to question 2 and 13. So it is a lot about uh, the dynamics of, uh, of uh, the duration. Speaking time statistics, this as well has to do a lot uh, with uh, how people actually distribute the speaking time. And so, uh, you know, in general, when there are quiet periods, you have a few people that tend to talk a lot because you know, there is time to express ideas and so on. When the conflict goes up, when there is more and more, more conflictual interaction, then people start trying to talk more, and so there is a bit more fragmentation in this type of statistics. Speaker adjacency statistics, this is something that has to do with preference structures. Uh, the point is that when there is a competitive discussion, if you do not react immediately to someone you disagree with, everybody will think that either you agree or you have no argument. So you have people that tend immediately to react to whoever they disagree with, and from this point of view, seeing peaks in the uh, statistics of uh, speaker adjacency, so two speakers that tend to speak immediately after one another, typically is a clear example that there is some, some more uh, conflictual interaction. Then overlapping speech statistics, again, everything, all of this is extracted automatically from, uh, from uh, the speech signals. Of course, in an ideal vision, times you know, are perfect. I talk, you talk, then another person talks, etc. But what happens? You have seen there is a lot of uh, overlapping speech, and this increases in particular when the conflict level goes, uh, goes up. So, again, automatically detecting the overlapping speech, how much between whom, uh, what are the people, turn keeping and turn stealing, so many times it happens that someone is speaking, then there is overlapping speech, and another person talks, which is an approximation of turn and stealing, and uh, so on. 
And then, in the end, statistics about uh, prosody, in particular pitch and intensity, so loudness. And these uh, uh, statistics are extracted at different levels. At the global level, which gives an idea whether the entire uh, clip is people speaking loud or speaking with high pitch. At the time level, to see whether, for example, you have only certain people behaving in a certain way and the other behaving differently and uh, at the overlapping speech level. Because overlapping speech doesn't necessarily mean that people are really uh, competing. Huh? Uh, when they are competing in overlapping speech, so you also have particular prosodic characteristics in those, uh, in those intervals. And this accounts of course for the way people talk. And once you have this, once you have transformed every clip into a sequence of numbers, features, measurable things, you can use statistics in order to predict uh, what is the inferential level. Now, the simple thing you can do is something very basic, which is to take the inferential score range, you cut it into two or three parts, or how many parts you want, and you just perform what is called a classification. So you take this number, and you try to predict automatically whether the clip is here, here, or here. And we did this. Huh? We did it with two classes. And here you have the performance expressed in terms of precision and recall. And the closer we are to this point here, which corresponds to 100%, 100%, the better it is. And so you see here that uh, how different types of features, we call conversational, everything has to do with turns and overlapping speech and prosodic, as a measurement in prosodics, and all means the two combines. And you see we have here different, uh, two different versions of, uh, sorry, this is uh, uh, basically the performance for the highest fold and, uh, sorry, the, 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 the upper half of the inferential layer range and the lower line of the inferential range. So you see that it's basically a bit easier to get uh, the lower level, which is a bit counterintuitive, but it is simply because, you know, uh, it tends to be, we tend to have more, uh, more cases, because we cut here, and this part is much denser than, than the other. Huh? So, at least for statistical reasons, we get uh, a bit better. So it is a good performance, uh, but the task is not that uh, exciting from this point of view. We did the same type of work with the three classes, which corresponds to the color you have seen. Again, you see that uh, in this case it becomes easier to get the higher because the problem becomes a little bit more complicated, so where there is a little bit more of behavioral evidence, the performance got better. And we are around always 70% in the best cases between uh, one and the other. Hmm? And so you have a first indication that by simply adopting statistical approaches, and here are my near kernel as the one of the most common but one of the most simple classifiers you can imagine, somewhat uh, you manage to perform this task. You manage to predict uh, the inferential layer, or at least a range of inferential layer, based on uh, physical measurement. Now, the same task is being performed, so it has been performed. The results are not public yet, but they're going to be made public very soon because it will be at interspeech, so I think it's half of the end of August, something like this. So several groups have participated uh, in an international benchmarking campaign where they are using the same data, using the same protocol. So we are going to see, a bit like we did for the personality data, we are going to see whether this performance uh, actually can be improved and what people can do in order to make it better or give an idea whether this task is actually challenged or not. However, you know, even the task is technically meaningful in the sense that it's something that can tell you something about the possibility of predicting, but when you think about, you know, cutting this range into pieces like this, doesn't really mean anything. I mean, I mean there is absolutely no reason, especially at the boundary, for a little fluctuation in the score, you go in one class or the other, this doesn't really mean uh, anything. So the best thing to do with this type of data is to try a regression approach, meaning we should not try to say it is in the lower, middle or upper third, 
but we should try to predict the exact value of the inference level. And this is exactly what uh, we did by applying a particular regression approach, which is called, I mean, the idea you see is that you don't want to have classes because the score here goes smoothly, it is continuous, I mean, it seems to be very much continuous, so you want to predict the exact uh, value. So we applied a number of different approaches based on Gaussian uh, processes, and we tried to see whether we could manage more smoothly, more continuously to predict uh, this, type of, uh, this type of score. And here you have, uh, you see, several different approaches, Bayesian linear regression, Gaussian processing regression, etc., etc., and it's not that important. But you see that there are three curves here. Uh, what you have here is the correlation between the actual and the predicted inference score. So the closer it is to one, the better it is the algorithm. But just to get, get an idea, so you see that uh, these are three versions of the system, of the approach. This includes some manual intervention, so the turns, you remember how important are the turns, are extracted manually. So there is one person that went there and one person, a few persons that really went there and cut into pieces corresponding to the turns. This corresponds to an automatic version, this is totally automatic, <coughs> but there is no attempt to identify overlapping speech. And this is another fully automatic version of the system, but there is an extra step that identifies overlapping speech and extracted features that correspond to overlapping speech. And you see that uh, while this definitely is lower than the other two, the two here are fundamentally in a statistical fluctuation. So even if there is a difference here, but the scores are so close that actually is, I and mean, from a statistical point of view, they are the same score, so there is no real difference. And you see that we are close to 0 0.8, which means that two-thirds of the variance of uh, the inferential score are explained by our approach. Now, these are just numbers. One interesting thing we managed to do, and it is something that we try to do more and more in social signal processing, so if we concentrate in particular on this approach, which is called Gaussian process regression with automatic relevance determination, this is a very nice uh, property in the sense that it can give weights to the different measurements you adopt. And as we have trained this model with a Bayesian approach, we can manage to get a distribution of those uh, parameters. So we can manage a distribution of this way. And so we can get an idea of what are the features that actually influence the prediction of the inference layer, at least from the point of view of our regression approach, but indirectly, probably, from the point of view of our uh, annotators. And we get something that here, it sounds very complicated, but now I'm going to explain. So here, on this axis, you have all the different measurements we extract, and there are something like uh, 100, so there are too many to be indicated. And here you have the weight that is associated to that particular measurement. And the many bars you don't see is because this weight is so low that it basically means that that particular feature does not really help, does not really influence the decision of the regression approach. So it is interesting to see what are the features that actually influence most. And you see that, for example, is the minimum of the pitch at the clip level, the minimum of the intensity at the clip level, the minimum of the mean, at the, the mean of the pitch at the turn level. Again, at the turn level, the minimum of the standard deviation of the pitch. The minimum, again, of uh, the median of the intensity at the turn level. So, basically, you see that the minimum value of a number of characteristics, in particular pitch and uh, intensity, seem to be what really drives the decision of this uh, classifier of this regressor. So, this applies in particular to the manual version, but we can see that the results get some confirmation also to the automatic version. So again, you see the minimum of the pitch, the minimum of the intensity, the minimum of the pitch median. Here you have the quantile at 1%, which is an approximation of the minimum. In the end, it's very close to the minimum in value. Minimum of the standard deviation of intensity, and, uh, and so on. 
And you see that there is a kind of empty here, simply because in the manual version, sorry, in the automatic version, there are a number of features you cannot extract. In particular, those who have to do with speaker adjacency, you cannot extract them because at that point you don't know anymore what is the role played by the speaker. And similar thing also when you add, I think this is the most realistic version because it is a fully automatic version of the system and it includes the overlapping speech. And you see again, minimum, 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 uh, etc. Of course, in some other cases, you also have the, the, the maximum that influences. But it's interesting to see that among the features that really influence the decision, the minima appears again and again. Now, what is the interpretation we give? Is that very probably what really drives a bit the perception of, uh, of the annotators is whether there is something that starts high, uh, people ever speak loud, and then nobody goes down, everybody tends to go up and up and up. So it seems to be the starting point from this point of view of, uh, in particular, pitch and intensity that really drives the perception. It goes back a little bit to what I said at the beginning, we would like to avoid simply getting people that shout, uh, but in the end it seems that uh, our annotators, that's what they do when they see people speaking louder, on average, they tend to think that there is a higher conflict level. Huh? So from this point of view, we go back exactly to what we wanted to, to avoid, but at least it is something that comes ex post and not ex ante, which is of course more interesting. Now, a few words uh, of conclusion. So based on this, it seems that in a case, behavior observations give us the possibility of somewhat uh, uh, measuring the conflict level, uh, or measuring something that might account for the conflict level, at least in the terms of the questionnaire we have defined. Eh? Because remember always that in the end, we are adopting a particular measurement instrument here, which is our questionnaire. Uh, so it seems that we managed to establish a correspondence between certain observable behavioral cues and uh, a number of considerations about what is the overall tone of the scene. It seems, I mean, based on this uh, uh, minima that, uh, that seem to influence the decision of the regression, that somewhat the idea is that the behavior of one pushes, during conflict, the behavior of one pushes the behavior of the others. So I shout, you shout louder, I start to interrupt you, you interrupt me even more, and so on. And this seems to be what really drives the perception of at least the decision of the regression approach. And overlapping speech appears, uh, this is not a surprise, of course, but really, according to the literature, overlapping speech seems really to be something that can change a lot. Because, I mean, once you add the automatic detection of overlapping speech, you really have a jump in terms of performance. Okay, and we are waiting for the results of the challenge to see whether there are better performance. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about body posture. Was that included in, in gesture or, or didn't you use it? No. In part because we have not found it in the literature, uh, uh, oh. it didn't appear as a potential uh, cue, or at least not that frequently. In part, uh, if you look at this particular setting, uh, it, it, a bit, it is a bit constrained. What is interesting in the case is to see if you remember the images, they are uh, If you think of this, you see that there is uh, one of these configurations which is really one against the other. Yeah. So two people for one is here and two people for the other is there and uh, But the, the, I think you, you could see also in this one that, that the woman was leaning more sure. and more forward. Yeah. Oh, and, and you see that quite often and, uh, we didn't really find it in the literature, so that's why it didn't appear. Mm. But clearly, it is a it is a QI Yeah, yes. uh, I've just been uh, wondering uh, for the annotators. Uh, the annotators are both looking at the uh, interpretation or the function, also the behavior in the same annotation path. Yeah. So yeah. Answering questions both at the level of <coughs> inference and also at the level of discipline. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if, if those two can lead across so that the annotator starts getting ideas about what you're looking for and therefore they might even see behavior that is not there because they're, they're basically constructing the idea that there is a conflict. 
something we should do? Actually, we did, we, for technical reason, we didn't manage to do it. Uh, so, do you think about having separate annotators? Well, yeah, this is something we should do. Actually, we did, we, for technical reason, we didn't manage to do, and it would be really nice to have people doing only the inferential layer or the physical layer and to see whether there was agreement. Mm -hmm. Still, in the questionnaire, they are not uh, aware of this distinction. The questionnaire means that yeah. they don't see the difference. <coughs> so this might have prevented a bit uh, this type of thing. And in any case, uh, if you look at the distribution uh, of uh, uh, the number of uh, clips annotated per uh, individual, per, per annotator, you will see that apart one guy that has really annotated a lot, I mean, in general, when you use a mechanical talk, you have this type of distribution. You have a lot of people that annotate two or three clips, and then a couple of people that annotate half of the clips, something like this. And I don't remember the exact numbers, I have them here so we can have a look together. So I think this long tail of annotators that has annotated three to five clips, I think they didn't really annotate enough to develop that type of thing. But there is this data that, that they, some of they start to co connect. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the most interesting uh, instances of conflict to me is when you don't even realize for an extended period of time that any conflict is happening. So in a context like this, it's almost uh, a, a social expectation that there's going to be a loud and very visible um, conflict. But there are um, conflicts we've all observed where it's like watching a chess game and one person moves their piece very quietly and then a few minutes later the other person quietly moves their queen and you only by observing over a very... And, how do you get at this kind of conflict, where the, the observable cues are there, but they're very subtle? And if they are too subtle, actually, machines, machines have a certain sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Below a certain level, they cannot go. So at the point, you have to really to work at the technical level. In the sense that one of the messages I really like to send with this type of questionnaire and stuff is, you can detect a certain spectrum of uh, phenomena and not others, if the cues are not observable or are below the sensitivity of the machine, no hope for the machine to get done. And yet you agree, these very quiet yes. conflicts yes. can be yes. among yes. the most intense. Uh, it has nothing to do with the real intensity of mm. the conflict. So yeah. the intensity of the, and one of the reasons I wanted to take uh, these particular debates is exactly that you have a very uh, I mean, when you look at the range of uh, the different cases, you have all possible, uh, it's a continuum. You don't have, like in other countries, you have Greek political debates, they start shouting at the beginning and they stop at the end. So there you have no, you have people shouting basically. Here you have all the type of thing, including the absence of conflict, you know, that the first people have shown, you know, yes, I mean, smoking is a problem, yes, smoking is a problem. There is no real uh, competition at the level. If there is no evidence in any case, if there is no detectable evidence, machines cannot get it. Even if the underlying conflict is extremely intense, you know, it's, it's, uh, machines can get only the measurable evidence. So that type of phenomenon is out of the range of machines. I would like to continue on those points of variation and so on. Actually, I have two points. One point is that in social sciences, there's been a lot of methodological critique, <coughs> questionnaire-based understanding of social behavior. Okay? The most extreme faction who hold this view or the conversational analysis. Yeah. Yeah. They really dislike this way of doing it, and I actually sympathize for that. Because I think that if you just ask what you're getting here are American ascribed views of Swiss French political behavior. And it's, it's to talk about physical level, there is no physical level. There, there is a culturally interpretive behavioral level. That's what you get, and you're getting it through American eyes. And I think it's dangerous to not realize that. I think in order to be on safer ground here, you should do a comparative 
third study only allowing Swiss French. The problem is the scale. Is there any yeah. difference in what the Americans say and what the Swiss French say? The problem is that you are confusing a bit the goal of conversational analysis and human sciences with our goal. You, the ground truth has to be something like the truth. You're not interested in just the perceptions or ascribed perceptions of people. You're actually interested in what these people are doing. So the goal is all the same, I think. Uh, yes and no, in this sense. For me, the point is that you are right. From the point of view of this, if I redo the experiment with the Swiss French, etc., I get another regressor that maybe can go a little bit better or a little worse, but fundamentally, it's just another instance from the same experiment. That's what I mean. Here, the point is really to show that you can establish a correspondence between something physically measurable and physical. something nothing physical here. I mean, you're asking people to do a questionnaire-based assessment of something they're seeing on video. But no, but I don't establish a correspondence between that the questionnaire. I establish a correspondence between physical measurements out of the signal and the assessments. And the assessments. Right. So inferential the, layer. Okay, so there are two. Okay. So you see this uh, last uh, thing here. Oops. Here I don't tell you overlapping speech, etc. I say the intensity during the periods of overlapping speech. I see, let's say, the intensity at the clip level, the mean pitch at the tongue level, which is something that you actually extract from the signal physically. But the judgment that this has to do with conflict is not physical. No, but that's exactly that's what they say since the beginning. Yeah. You try to establish a bridge between these low-level physical measurements, and we decided for those measurements based on the question of on nonverbal cues. In the sense that some of the, the, the question there gives us an idea of what is the physical measurements that can account, and the inferential layer, which are five questions. And but, about the okay, but these talk. evaluations or these assessments, yes. I think I would still feel more comfortable if we had a comparative study where we actually got some Swiss French people to. That that would be interesting, but, yeah. but at the same time, I mean, it doesn't change anything in the statistics. No, and, and the other, of course, type of variation is what Joel is bringing up. You know, sometimes within cultures, we've for a long time had a distinction between hot conflicts and cold conflicts. Yes, yes, yes. And the cold conflicts, you're not going to be able to see. No, you don't see. No, you don't see. And, uh, and they are, and in some cultures, they are more common than in others. So now we come sure. back to. So, for example, right now you're in a place where people inhibit conflict a lot, sure, all sure. the time, and then they maneuver. So no, clearly, <laughs> uh, if there is no evidence, you don't get it. And this is an important message when you work with machines. Something that has no detectable evidence is something that you cannot see. Yeah, but it also means maybe that more of the uh, emphasis and focus in cold conflict is in the verbal content. And so the, the whole idea of SSP being about those aspects which are not in the verbal context, actually maybe you're missing out on one important dimension of how we pursue conflict. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. just because such a single person concentrates on the verbal part doesn't mean that the other one no. is important. Clearly, if right. the evidence, if the privileged evidence is verbal, you have with machine, the only hope you have is to pass through verbal. Right. And that's, that's, uh, so, so it's sort of doing the, yeah, the non-verbal aspects of conflict is what's going on here, really. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah no, clearly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. here it's... it's uh, we focus on that and we are limited by that. Uh, with, with, uh, Anyway, I, it's interesting, and I, I, since we are a multicultural gathering here, we, it should inspire to more of these, making sure that, that you know, what is really universal in features of culture and what is more cultural specific, we could actually maybe understand a little more of that. Yeah, that's <coughs> interesting. It's, it's, it's technically, how can I say, the problem is getting the way we do that, the reason why we went for the US, because we wanted to be a bit independent of the verbal part, it was part of our goal, and to isolate with respect to the cultural effort. It would take in principle people all over the world with mechanical talent can do it, mm -hmm. but at least we selected one, uh, one part. Yeah. 
that's the way we're basically we're doing because as far as I know, yeah, nobody tries this type of comparative things, essentially because from a technical point of view, it's not as appealing as it can be from a human sciences point of view. Mm -hmm. so at the point you have two models, you compare them, but technically it doesn't really give you an advance. I don't know if you can see, that's why probably there is a bias in the computing community, but it, it, it would be interesting to include it. I'm doing it actually in another project about other type of data, mm -hmm. And we will see there what we yeah, get. Then, uh, uh, did I see your hand also? Uh, yeah, I have some question, but I don't know. I thought it was silly after 15 seconds, so I, I dropped it. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, it's good uh, if there are no other questions, then we have some time for uh, refreshments now. Thank you again. Thank you.